Well, welcome everybody to another episode of the Connected Podcast. Today, I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Marissa Franco, uh, author of the book Platonic. So we're going to deep dive into that uh, today and talk a little bit more about friendships and the importance of friendships and romances and all that good stuff. So really excited to have this conversation and uh, want to just say welcome, uh, Marissa. How have you been? Thank you so much, Ray. I've been good. It's great to see you. Same here. So how, how did you get the idea to, to write a book about friendship? So actually, it was because in my young 20s, I was going through these breakups and feeling so bad. And I ended up starting this wellness group with my friends where we met up each week to practice wellness. And I realized that part of the reason I took the breakup so badly is because I thought, you know, romantic love was the only love that mattered. Mm. But every week I had so much evidence that I was so loved and I had all this love around me. And I was like, well, why should this not matter? Like, why don't we consider platonic love as enough, as significant, as fulfilling? Why is it under so underestimated? And so I started to read different books on friendship and none of them, I guess, scratched my itch of like really elevating friendship to the sacred relationship that I felt it had been in my life. So I decided I'd write it. Wow, that that's awesome. And really, I think that that's really the key, right? It's like I, I, I write books that I need. Right. The, the book that I needed to, to read at some point in my life and uh, and it doesn't exist. So let me do it. That's that's awesome. Awesome uh, uh, motivation for anybody out there who is, uh, you know, thinking about doing something and, uh, you know, need some motivation just simply because you can help yourself. And, and if you if it helps you, there's thousands of other people like you who could need who use it, could use that same help. So, so you know, I've been so interested in in some of the the posts that you've done recently. Uh, yeah, I think you, when you talked about it, really kind of raised my eyebrows was about you know love and and being in love with your friends. And as a man, I don't know how I feel about that, right? <laughs> you hear the term bromance, right? And, and so, it, so is that a thing for men as well as women? So actually, historically, romance was more a part of friendship than marriage mm. um, because people got married for practical reasons. It was a way to pool resources. And, and, you know, in the early 1800s and before, at least in the Western world, people thought that the genders were so distinct that there wasn't really a way for them to feel so deeply connected. Mm. So at that time, people would turn to their friends to do things like cuddle hold hands. They would write love letters to each other. This was men and women. And the thing that really changed that was um, Sigmund Freud and another psychiatrist called Richard von Kraft Ebbing mm -hmm. and their sort of scholarship on sexual orientation. Because before them, basically it was stigmatized to have sex with someone of the same sex, but not for a constellation of behaviors that could suggest or indicate sexuality. Like, oh, you're holding hands, so you must be gay. Or you're telling your friend you love them, so you must be gay, right? None of that was the case. It was just, if you have having sex with someone, that's really bad. And, you know, we're going to use it against you. But none of those other behaviors indicated sexuality. And that's because there was no such thing as sexual orientation. It wasn't an identity. <laughs> um, so it was just, don't have sex with someone who's your same sex, but not, you have this larger identity and this constellation of behaviors that suggests that identity. And so what happened was Richard Von Kraft Egling and Freud, they created homosexuality, they created heterosexuality as a way to say that it's not okay. Um, they sort of argued that it was a larger identity um, as a way to argue against it. And in doing so, um, they created something called homo hysteria, which is our fear of being perceived as gay. Um, and that, that fear just really harms straight people's friendships because anything that you can do to connect with people could be perceived as gay, right? And so I think straight men in particular feel like they can't love their friends fully. They can't love their friends deeply. It's not that they don't feel those emotions, but they don't let themselves because of homo hysteria, the fear of being perceived as gay, which men in the early 1800s didn't have to contend with. That is so interesting. It's this interesting story. I actually heard a comedian yesterday. Uh, he was uh, talking about how uh, he moved out to L.A. He, he moved to a new city and trying to make friends. And he met a guy. He assumed, he always assumed as many men do, that gay men act a certain way they're flamboyant like you know a gay man when you see it and he made a friend and the friend invited him over they had a couple of beers whatever they they went out they actually went to a basketball game and and had a great time he's like man this is my man great and then the dude tried to kiss him 
at the end of the night. Like, whoa, I'm not gay. And then the guy was like, well, why'd you go on a date with me? Mm. I don't know. It, it was so really interesting. Just what you're saying, I think, is so. It, it, but the, the funny part, the, the punchline was, and and the, the 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 friend was like, you know, I got season tickets, and like, <laughs> you know, so so let me think about that about my my sexual orientation. No, that is uh, that is really interesting. Um, yeah. Wow. But but this is the thing, and and that story I think kind of touches on it a little bit about. How, because people feel uncertain how to make friends, how to pick friends, particularly as we move around now, where we're very mobile society. Um, yeah. You move to a new city and you, you're disconnected from the folks you grew up with. How do you make friends? Yeah, so I think the problem is that we we have these myths about friendship. One being that it should happen organically, and that comes from as when we're children and it does happen organically because at that time we have what sociologists consider necessary for friendship to happen organically, which is repeated unplanned interaction and shared vulnerability. And you get that in school, you get that in recess, you know, you have that in gym, um, having all these classes together, group projects. But as we're, we move forward into adulthood, a lot of us don't have environments that are like that, like the workplace. Yeah. We see each other continuously over time, but we're not often vulnerable. We're not sharing who we truly are. And so what that means is as adults, we need different strategies. We need to be very intentional when it comes to making friends. We need to initiate, right? People are so afraid to initiate because they think other people will reject them. But I wish we all collectively knew how much people are like a lot more likely to accept you than you think they are. Um, and this is true according to the science. These researchers asked people to strike up conversation with people on their commute. Nobody was turned down. Um, the other thing is that, you know, something I always suggest when it comes to making friends is assume people like you, because that allows you to actually initiate. And um, the research actually finds, according to this phenomenon called the liking gap, that when strangers interact and afterward you ask them, how much do you think the other person likes you? We actually have this bias to underestimate how much people like us. So we can take credit for that by assuming people like us. And, and furthermore, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's called the acceptance prophecy. When we assume people like us, we become more friendly and more engaging. When we assume people are going to reject us, we become closed off, we become withdrawn, and then we're more likely to be rejected. So initiate, 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 assume people like you, and then just be like, oh, it's really great to connect with you. Like, I'd love to follow up. Let's hang out some time. Yeah, that is so great. Um, and, and I am, I am, uh, I guess, a prime example of that. And part of why I started my connection coaching is I suffered when I was younger. And I assumed, as you just mentioned, that people didn't like me, that people didn't want to yeah. be around me, that I just kind of had this assumption until I changed, but I was, I was much older. I was an adult when I realized that I needed to change that belief system because to your point, as I think you mentioned uh, in, in your recent post, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that when you think people don't like you, you act in ways that will make you unlikable and, exactly. and people don't connect with you. And so you, you don't get invited to stuff because people think you don't want to come. And then you say, well, I'd never get invited to stuff. And it becomes that, that loop. And so, so I had to change that loop. And so that's why I'm so excited about your books. I know a lot of people suffer from that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I have to, I will say life has gotten easier since I begin to try to uh, the practice of making that assumption. Cause I don't think, you know, you just tell it to yourself one time and all of a sudden all of your assumptions change. No, you're absolutely right. And I even tell uh, my clients, you know, affirmations work, you know, you, it, you know, you can affirm, you know, you, you, it's changing your self-talk, right? So there's exactly. a, a auto, automa automatic negative uh, thoughts that uh, I, I tell them to, to watch out for the ants, right? The, the automatic mm -hmm. negative thoughts that just pop in your head. Well, they don't like me. They won't invite me. They don't want to talk to me. And, and that's rarely true. What, what do you want people to take away from from your from your book, so if somebody reads your book, what, what do you want them to take away from it? There are so many different. Like I feel like each chapter has so many things that I want people to take away. I always, you know, in these podcasts, I'm always talking about the initiation chapter and how important it is to initiate. But you know, I had chapters on vulnerability and authenticity that I thought were also really important. You know, from my research. Vulnerability is like a super connector, right? Like if people are vulnerable with you, you feel more connected with them, but we tend to feel like it's a burden. <laughs> and so we have all these sort of misconceptions about how we're perceived that cause us to straightjacket our potential to actually connect with people. And vulnerability is one of those things. It's actually called the beautiful mess effect that when we're vulnerable, 
we think people are judging us more than they actually are. And we underestimate how much they're liking us because they see us as being more authentic and honest. And, you know, meta-analyses would summarize all the research out there actually find that the more people intimately self-disclose, the more liked they are by other people. So I guess that's another thing that I would share. Like, it's really important to be vulnerable. And I think sometimes this can, we, we don't engage in vulnerability because we feel like, oh, I'm not strong if I'm vulnerable. I come off as weak, but actually the science shows that the way we become strong is by being vulnerable and other people affirming us. And then we internalize that be, to become part of ourselves. And if you're just feeling like, oh, I'm strong through being invulnerable and independent, that's actually a defensive sense of strength, which is a lot more fragile than the people that develop that strength through sharing themselves, receiving affirmation, and then allowing that to be embodied in their own sense of self. Wow. Powerful. That's powerful. Um, it's interesting, actually, a, a study I would like to see. I've always been curious about, you know, you know, the kids who raise their hands in class, how they end up in life. Right. Because I think that comes yeah. down to vulnerability. Right. Because I, yeah. I was I never felt comfortable raising my hand, even if I had a question. You know, the teacher would yeah. say any questions. I was embarrassed to admit I didn't know things. I thought of myself, my persona is I was a smart kid and I wasn't, I was shy, right? People didn't know me, but that was the one thing I kind of hang my hat on. People perceived me as being above average intelligence. And I felt that if I asked questions publicly, uh, and part of that I think is, is the, the introversion too, um, right. you know, just, you know, but, but being vulnerable, but I I'm curious if those kids who raise their hands more often had better outcomes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know about raising hands specifically, but I know people that initiate in general um, have a lot better outcomes when it comes to friendship. They're less lonely. They're more popular. You know, they get more dates, like all, all of the things that you want for your relationships initiation can can lead to. But, you know, just remember that because I think I used to not initiate because I was like, is this going to do anything? <laughs> like, I don't know. It was like this this sort of like fate or destiny. I'm going to make friends. Or I'm going to not. It doesn't really matter if I put myself out there and try like that. Friendship should happen organically. Like it's a, it's a myth. It's a mythology. It's a magic. And that was just so wrong. And I wish that I knew that so that I could be more intentional about making connections with people. And I think those so that mythology protects us from being vulnerable, right? Because it's like, I don't have to try because trying makes me feel vulnerable. So instead, I'm going to create this belief system where this all happens magically. And then I don't have to confront those feelings of vulnerability. And so I think, Ray, when it, it comes to building connections, it's less about avoiding vulnerability and more about being like, I want to be in a place where if I'm rejected, that'll be okay. Like I want to build up my resources and my sense of self so that this inevitable experience of rejection will be okay. Because, you know, I think ultimately being rejected tells you that you're curating the life that you want, that you're going for what you want, right? And the worst outcome is never being rejected because that means you're never going to get the life that you want because you haven't put yourself out there to actually try. So rejection, and it never feels like it, but in the long term, I think it's a great success. Interesting. That's, that's, that is such an interesting um, uh, point of view. I, and I love that, but it makes sense that, yeah, the, that's how you find out. That's how you can also improve yourself, right? If you never get rejected. Um, and, and I think I, I hear this a lot from very attractive people. Uh, and I've anecdotally, very attractive people tend to be unhappy, right? Because they never have, they never have that, that push to improve other things. It's like, because I'm attractive, things tend to work out for me. People like me more. I just, it just is what it is, but they don't have that uh, drive to improve other areas of their life. And they tend to, uh, as they get older, uh, become unhappy, you know? So, mm. and I don't know if the science bears that out, but that's just my pop psychology. <laughs> I don't know either, but I, I will say we all need challenge and we all need growth. Yeah, we, all, we all need challenge and growth. Good stuff. Wow. Uh, so, so we got this book coming out. What's, what's the, what's the release date now? Uh, it's coming out September 6th and mm -hmm. the full title is platonic, how the science of attachment can help you make and keep friends. Yeah, and that, it's currently out on pre-order. Yes, everybody get this book. It is great. I, I, I think it's, it's so needed um, just from a society. And I know we only have a few minutes left, but, but uh, you know, just from a society, I, I read a, a book uh, years ago called Bowling Alone. Yeah, I to, love that book. It talks about how our society has become so disconnected and, and, and people are, you know, living their lives without without friends, without friendships and, 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 and technology 
makes this possible and you become friends with your social feed and they're not really friends but i think at a core we we're missing out on something so i do think um there's a lot of importance to to your message and, and what you're talking about absolutely you know after studying this and i think after going through this pandemic all of us has realized that it's such a fundamental need to socialize and, and connect. Like it's like water. We need water. We need food. We need to socialize, you know, and it's alarming how lonely we are right now. And loneliness is very toxic for our bodies. In fact, the research finds being lonely is actually worse for your longevity than a poor diet or a lack of exercise. And being lonely is actually akin to smoking 15 cigarettes a day and its effect on your long-term health and well-being. And it's a crisis. It's really a crisis. If you really understand the science. Um, but still, I feel like we don't talk about it enough. Um, people feel afraid to admit that they're lonely. We are never taught how to connect with people. And, you know, even in the pandemic, I found, you know, there's research that the people that were more lonely were less likely to follow the social distancing protocols, right? Like, it's just, for, I think for a society to function, we ultimately need to feel connected because that brings out the side of ourselves that allows for a productive society. And, and there's a lot of ways that we have to trust for society to run, right? I have to trust this bank. I have to trust, you know, my school system's not going to steal all my tuition money. And, and when we're lonely, we're a lot more mistrusting. And so, you know, you could, you could speculate all, uh, you know, you could speculate long and hard about how our political system and what's happening politically could be undergirded by loneliness in part amongst other things. Um, but yeah, we're just simply not fully human. I think when we're constantly lonely. Ooh, that's powerful. But shoot, I dropped the mic on that. I, I think that, <laughs> that that's it. I mean, what, what else can you say? We're, we're not fully human when 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 we're lonely and um and i i talk about that and that's why you know i talk connected right i i uh i, I think it works not just with personal relationships with, with, but with business relationships and connection and i where our message is aligned in that people think that in their business relationships or in their working um, lives uh they they don't make friends they separate their work from the and that's we were taught that you shouldn't i was taught that you shouldn't make friends at work you have a work life and a work persona and then you have your personal life like your 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 work uh colleagues shouldn't be on your facebook page right or yeah. or follow they shouldn't follow you on instagram because that's your person i'm just like but 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 you spend so much time with these folks. Why not find a way to make friends with them? And, and I think people who can find, figure that out have better outcomes because people hire their friends, they promote their friends or people Absolutely. that they like. Right. And so yeah. I don't know if your book touches on on that at all. Um, it's something that I do speaking events and I speak at corporations about how to make friends and how to find belonging, because, you know, the research does find that friends at work promotes better performance, better innovation, more cohesive teams, people are more likely to be retained. And there was this McKinsey report that came out and it, it actually found that, you know, this whole great resignation thing, the top three reasons why people were resigning were related to problems of connection. They didn't feel valued or they didn't feel like they belonged. Right. And, yeah. and so I think, you know, I call it the employee myth. Sometimes we think that we get to work and we're just employees and we no longer have fundamental human needs and we can just sit at a laptop all day and, and clack on the keyboard and, from the science, we know that that's untrue. We have the need to belong and it's it's ever present, whether we're at work or whether we're not. Wow. That's, that's powerful. Well, good stuff. Well, Dr. Franco, I sure appreciate you, uh, you appearing on the Connected Podcast. I think that my listeners definitely uh, would resonate with your message. And we're looking forward to the book being well, it's available now for pre-order. Um, but definitely when it's on the shelves, uh, if you haven't gotten it already, uh, make sure you pick up that copy of Platonic. And I don't want to say the whole, the subtitle. Uh, <laughs> How the science of attachment can help you make and keep friends. Gotcha. Gotcha. Awesome. So yeah, so look out for that, everybody. And, uh, and thank you so much again, Dr. Franco, for joining the Connected Podcast. It's my pleasure, Ray. Cool.